good evening, church. Would you stand with us? Sing a few worship songs. I have heard a sound coming on the wind, changing hearts in darkness we will rise and say he is faithful he is glorious and he is jesus and all my hope is in him he is freedom And letting lame men walk I see a generation With resurrection life We are a generation Filled with the power of Christ And our song, it will be Out of the dark we will rise and sing. He is faithful. He is glorious. And He is Jesus. And all my hope is in Him. He is freedom. He is healing right now.
need that tonight. <laughs> God, thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for being so, so good to us. Even when we may be distracted or tired, Lord, you continue to invite us in to draw near to you. So, Jesus, that's what we want to do. We want to worship you. We want to draw near to you. We want to hear your voice. And we want to keep worshiping. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. 
Above all 
nothing can stand against what a powerful name it is the name of jesus what a powerful name is the name of jesus what a powerful name it is the name of jesus Lord, we just worship your name. We know that uh, the volume of our music and the volume of our voices will never compare to the glory of your name. And your, your name deserves all the worship and all, all the praise we could ever give, Father. But you alone and your glory alone is sufficient. You don't need us. You don't need my guitar. You don't need my voice. You are great. You were great thousands of years before I existed. You are great yesterday, today, and forevermore. And I pray that as your church, that we would open our eyes and our ears to hear the song of heaven, that you are great, God. That all of creation sings that you are great. Hallelujah. And Lord, we just praise your name. We don't wait for a song, Father. And I pray that we, we would never stop our praise because the song is over, God. May it continue in our hearts, continue in our minds that holy is the Lord, worthy is the Lord. Jesus, you are great. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ. My King, what a beautiful name it is. Oh, nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is. The name. Of When I think of all these stars and I was looking over here, I'm thinking to myself, and I'm looking at the back of the screen. I don't know if you can see that. But do you know how many uh, galaxies are in the universe? Anybody? Huh? Unlimited? Pretty close. Trillions. How many stars are there? Trillions and trillions of stars. All right, let's take a little bit closer to home. What galaxy do we live in? Oh, there's somebody who knows. The Milky Way galaxy. Do you know how wide the Milky Way galaxy is in space? It it's 46.5 billion light years. Light travels at 1.579 followed by 12 zeros in a year. So do the math on that and it'll blow your mind. But that is how big our home galaxy is. And then when you times that by the trillions of stars and the galaxies. That's why I love seeing all these postings that you get from the Hubble and the Webb telescope that just shows going back in time to see what things look like. And then you go, man, our God's a pretty big God. And the funny thing about it is, is he numbers all the stars by name. Now, I don't know how you come up with trillions of names for stars, but I'm not God, and I'm gonna, I think I'm just going to leave that with him. But... The reality is we serve a mighty God, and, uh, and I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful that there's a God in heaven who loves me, who cares for me, and uh, amen for that, yeah. 
The other thing that we need to be cognizant of is, you know, this, we this weekend is Father's Day. Any dads in the room? Any dads in the room? Quite a few hands coming up, popping up. You know, uh, I didn't know my dad. My dad died when I was about four years of age. And uh, so I've seen pictures of him. I have a couple of memories of him in a car. That's about it. And so, but I do know this. I bear his name. I bear his likeness. And uh, even though I have, don't know anything really about him, except for what my mom has told me, uh, the reality is, is that he left a legacy in my life for four years. Too bad I was too young to be able to understand that legacy, but, but for those of you guys that are still here, and you have children that are still alive, you have the opportunity to leave an amazing legacy. What will they remember you by when you go to heaven? Will it be a, will it be a memorial service, a celebration? nice things said, or will people even show up? Man, that guy was a dirty rascal, you know? I don't know. But you know what? All that to say that you guys, dads, you have an amazing opportunity to leave a legacy every day with your, fa with your family, your kids, and I hope that you're rec you recognize that, you're cognitive of that, and you take advantage of that. You know? It's a great thing. Let's pray, and let's get into uh, the evening. Father in heaven, thank you so much for Dad's Day weekend and um, this Sunday that we recognize dads. Of course, every day is Dad's Day. Every, every day is a mom's day, but uh, our world or this society that we live in has its special days, and so we take time to honor the dads in this room and ask your blessing upon them and help them to leave the legacy that only they can live and living out their lives in such a way to leave a blessing to their, their children. And what a blessing that is. I will never have that opportunity. I don't have any kids, but uh, that's okay. That's my lot in life, but everybody has a different walk with you, and I pray that those who have children exist with you in the time. Lord, thank you for the time of worship, and thank you now as we get time in your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good evening, you all, and welcome to Orange County Singles and Couples for Christ. And uh, Hey, did you guys see the sun today? Yeah. I forgot all what the heck that thing even looked like after most of May was gloomy and most of June so far has been gloomy, at least where I live anyway. Haven't seen the sun until late today. Pretty cool. What's, then it's thunder showers tomorrow, is that right? Or is that Sunday? Somewhere along the line, I thought we were coming up for rain. They say, coming up. We'll see about that. <laughs> Turning to our visitors who may be here for the first time, welcome. Glad that you're here. Thank you for choosing to come visit us uh, this evening, and hopefully so far you've enjoyed your experience. We are a uh, church that is designed for just two life stages, singles and couples, and um, we hope that you come back and make uh, Orange County Singles a part of your spiritual journey. As uh, Every Friday night, it's almost a different crowd every Friday night, but I'm glad that you all are here. And we're here to enjoy some worship, time in God's Word, and then lots of fellowship afterwards. But for the visitors, may I humbly say it's a pretty cool, uh, uh, pretty cool place. We do events. We've done hundreds of events, dances, all sorts of stuff. And uh, you'll see that online. Matter of fact, you go online right now. All the events through July are uh, on our event site. You'll hear about some tonight. Others we've left off just to shorten the announcement time. But visitors, if you have any questions about what we're, all, what we're all about, please see me afterwards. I'll be running around the hallways. So tonight I'm uh, continuing a series entitled The Will of God. But I'm in the midst of a rabbit trail to dwell on a, a topic that I think is of amazing importance, enormous importance to you and I as Christians. Now, the last couple of weeks we've been looking at the will of God and to understand and know that a lot of people don't realize that there is a will of God and that there are several wills of God that are mentioned in Scripture. One of them is called the sovereign decrees of God, and the other one is called the will of God of command. The sovereign decrees of God are absolutes. There's no waywardness with God, no changing of mind, no bending with God. What he has purposed to do, he is going to do. And what he has purposed to do, he purposed it from all eternity. Whatever in the sovereign will of God is, that's the way it's going to be. Absolutely nothing can stand in the way of the sovereign decrees of God. The, the will of command, though, is different. It is what God wants us to do, 
but he knows that we're going to break his commands of will, either by choice or by accident. We're human. The amazing truth about God is what, uh, and what he has done for us, and it really hasn't been experienced by mankind until the beginning of the church age, or at the day of Pentecost, when the church began, that God has allowed people, his kids, the body of Christ, to experience his life nature. We've been granted the capability and the capacity to be partakers of his divine nature. And get that into your heads. One who is infinite has allowed us to be able to enter into infinity, so to speak, and have a glimpse of certain things that are about him that he imparts to you and I. His divine nature was imparted to you and I in an instant. When you got saved and when you were born again, the moment of your salvation, when we got born again, two things happened. A, Jesus Christ, God the Father and God the Son, or excuse me, the Holy Spirit, came into our lives and the process of our dead spirit coming alive to him. All three in the Godhead now have residence in us and our spirit came alive to him Hence the term that Jesus used, being born again. Our sins have been forgiven, past, present, and even into the future. We all have been given a spiritual gift to be used in building up the body of Christ. The second thing that happened, now being born again, you should in some way, you should in some way, shape, or form experience. When you come alive to God, there should be an experience there of some degree. The second one is true is because the Holy Spirit took for you and put you and placed you into the body of Christ. Therefore, all the truths about Jesus Christ are true for you tonight. He is in the heavenly places. Who else is in the heavenly places? You and I are. We are seated with him in the heavenly places. How does that work? I don't have a clue, but we're told that. He's righteous. We're righteous. He's justified. He uh, justifies us. He's called us. He's predestined us. We've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, according to Ephesians chapter 1. We're even going to co-rule and co-reign with him throughout eternity. Get that one into your minds, that the king of kings is going to allow you and I to partake in and to co-rule his kingdom. These truths you may not have experienced. Their theological precepts are called... Um, uh, uh, they're called positional truths. Because you're in Jesus Christ, these things are true for you. These two events happened immediately upon our conversion. One's felt, the other is not. The greatest gift that God has given to you and I at salvation was the gift of the Holy Spirit. Got to know that. The Holy Spirit was the best thing God ever gave to you and I. He is the Spirit of Christ. He is fully God. He's distinct from the Father and the Son. And the Holy Spirit doesn't take bodily form. Jesus did, the second person of the Trinity did, in the person of Jesus Christ. The Bible does show us a picture of God the Father. Holy Spirit is not in bodily form. But his presence in yours and my life is unmistakable, more than welcomed. And the more we want to know the Holy Spirit, all you have to do is cry out in prayer. He is there, living within you, waiting to have a conversation with you and I. He is available on a moment's notice. He's there for us. In this slide in 1 Peter chapter 1, going back to last week for just a moment. In 1 Peter chapter 1, 3, or excuse me, 2 Peter chapter 1, 3 through 4, says this. Thanks be to God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, I should have that memorized by now. I've gone through it a million times. Seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. For by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises in order that by them we might become partakers of the divine nature and escape the corruption that is in the world by lust. Two forces are at work in yours and my life right now. 
there's a corruption taking place that is headed up by lust, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the boastful pride of life, and then there's the divine nature. Both of them are at war with each other. Whichever one you feed is the one who's going to win. You can sow to the flesh, and you'll lose. You sow to the Spirit, you will win. The Holy Spirit is there for you all the way. He's granted to us His precious and magnificent promises. Mm. Everything pertaining to life and godliness. Life is life. Godliness is how to walk in a worthy way. Everything. Nothing has been left out. The agency that makes that happen is the presence of the Holy Spirit in yours and my life. He is there. We're going to review it just a little bit from last week, and then we're going to get into spiritual gifts tonight. Hope so. Hang on. Put your seatbelts on. Now, obviously, we're not God. Never will be. But to a certain degree, we can be filled with his life. The Christian life, as I've said before, is a supernatural life. It's a supernatural calling. There's no way in God's green and blue earth that you can obey his commands of will, of the will. There's no way to live out the Christian life in your own strength. It's in strength. It's impossible. The only person who will accomplish that task and feat is Jesus Christ himself. And even then, if you read the Gospels, there's always this interaction between him and the Holy Spirit. The will of a command that God has for our lives is in the hundreds throughout the New Testament. But nevertheless, they're there, and God knows we'll break them along the way. However, through his strength and power, to a certain extent, as you mature in Christ, you can do pretty good at following his wills of command. It's because his power is more and more released in you as he gets more and more of you, and as you understand how to appropriate the Holy Spirit in your life, you have more and more victory in your life. Now, we've been looking at the sovereign degrees of God. Tonight I'm looking, the, the subtitle is Ultimate Power, because you have ultimate power. We talked about the universe earlier, the Milky Way galaxy, 46.5 billion light years wide. And how long does it take light to travel in one year? 1.5789 followed by 12 zeros. I mean, it's just a mess. But the same power that created this universe lives right in your heart. Did you know that? The same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead is living within you right now. Ultimate power is a phrase that was used in one of my favorite movies, E.T., where the kids were always making each other swear to one another, you have ultimate power, you have ultimate power. So let's proceed. Power is released to us in and through us through the indwelling person of the Holy Spirit. The ministry of the Holy Spirit is exceedingly important, as I said before in years of my life, because if you don't know how to talk to the Holy Spirit, and I said talk, you are powerless to live the Christian life. You're like the person sitting in a beautiful Lincoln Navigator SUV. I think they're pretty cool, by the way. Man, they caught more bells and whistles than you can shake a stick at. But if you don't know how to drive a Lincoln Navigator, what good is it? What good is it? It's like our salvation. It's a beautiful thing. But if you don't know how to appropriate and use it correctly, you're missing out. You see, we face an enemy on every side. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the bolts of the pride of life. We have the adversary we have to deal with, a society that's more and more rejecting the person and works and teaching of Jesus Christ. And sadly, most people in, in Christian circles are ignorant to what God has freely given to us via the Holy Spirit's presence. You didn't earn it. You couldn't buy it. You couldn't be rewarded by doing good. It was given to you freely. In this slide of the Trinity, the best one I can come up with that kind of describes the, the Trinity, because we do worship a triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Going cross ways, the Father is not the Son. Going down, the Son is not the Holy Spirit. And going back up, the Holy Spirit is not God the Father. And yet, they are all God. Three individuals, one in nature, one in essence. That is the Christian understanding of the Trinity. In this study tonight, I've honored for about three weeks. We're just scratching the surface, by the way, about the Holy Spirit. He's an amazing individual in yours and my life. Holy, the New Testament describes a very intimate relationship between Jesus and the Holy Spirit, including even his birth, 
to Mary and Joseph, which we covered last week, and you can look the video up online and review it that way. As to the Holy Spirit's work in our life, there are many. As I mentioned last week, the Holy Spirit is not an option in your life. You don't get to choose it, yes or no. It comes with being born again, being saved. It is put in, he is put inside of you the day you called out to him to be your Savior and Lord. His presence comes to us and in us on the day we got saved, and that process is irreversible. You cannot lose the Holy Spirit. You can grieve him. You can quench him. But you cannot get rid of him, ever. An acid, a good acid test of whether you're a believer or not is Romans chapter 8, verse 9. However, you are not in the flesh but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he or she doesn't belong to him. That's the acid test. The Holy Spirit's presence in yours and my life. The Holy Spirit has many roles to play in the life of the believer. He's our comforter. He reveals truth. He's our teacher. He gives us gifts, which we'll look at tonight. We have, he's the harvester of fruits that we'll look at next week. But we have to understand that the Holy Spirit, first and foremost, is working in the hearts of people. Even you, when you were not saved, he was already there working in your life to get you ready for your time of repentance. In John chapter 16, verses 8 and 9, we're told, and when he, and he, when he comes, will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment, concerning sin because they do not believe in me. The biggest sin that anybody can ever commit is not believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. He's left his miracles, the, the New Testament, the Holy Spirit. But if you don't believe in Jesus Christ, that is the greatest sin you can possibly have. Everyone has fallen short of the glory of God. Concerning righteousness, because people cannot earn their righteousness, they cannot earn their way into heaven based on their works of righteousness, everybody falls short, way short, in judgment, showing that people will have to answer for their life and how they lived it in this life, because there's more to come just after this physical life. Eternity begins. Eternity begins one of two places. The Holy Spirit was speaking and is speaking to the hearts and minds of people to show them that they're sinners and in need of God's righteousness and that there will be judgment day someday. The Holy Spirit brings these truths to the minds of people to convince them they need to repent. Our world today says sin's okay. As a matter of fact, our world today is just shoving it down people's throats in order for us to accept sin. The issue has to do with acceptance. You will never find acceptance with God with a, with a lifestyle that is contrary to what he accepts. It's his rules. It's his universe. It's his earth. And God says there's a right way to walk with me and there's a wrong way. And if you go down the wrong way path, it has consequences that are devastating. The Holy Spirit is the one who brings us to salvation. Titus chapter 3, 5 and 6. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration through the Holy Spirit. Uh, excuse me, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out upon us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. The Holy Spirit has been lavished upon you and I, poured out. You can't get enough of him. You will never get enough of him poured out upon you and I. We were saved because of his mercy. That God saw that we were helpless in our, our dead state, and God was the one to make the first move. And it had been preparing our hearts for us to get to that place where we would call upon his name when the opportunity came and it started to make sense in yours and my life. And the washing of regeneration is the Holy Spirit regenerates you and I. Somewhere in our lives, we heard the gospel, proclaimed to us. And however it happened, God the Holy Spirit was there gently wooing your heart and your mind. Which really takes the pressure off when it comes to evangelism. You see guys down at the uh, Huntington Beach uh, Pier or at the Spectrum. I just found out today there's a guy who was down the street at Irvine Valley College. He 
Evangelism is important. But it's not about our forcefulness of speech or our charisma, although you're probably good at you brush your teeth and that kind of stuff. It's not about your eloquent speech. God is already there through the person of the Holy Spirit, and he's testifying through you, touching their hearts, getting them to respond. There's no pressure. We get all freaked out. They say that less than 1%. Now, I'm sure that's not true here. Maybe it's 2%. Let's go with 2% to be generous. Only 2% of Christians have ever led somebody to Jesus Christ. Did you know that? That is a really low statistic when that's one of the things we're supposed to do. The Bible is clear that people are dead to God spiritually, and it's an act of God to wake people up. So the pressure's off. The salvation is of the Lord is clearly seen in John chapter 1, 13 and 14. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born, in other words, born again, not of blood, in other words, it's not through the family line, nor the will of the flesh, in other words, I can get myself saved, or some by the will of man, somebody trying to get us saved, but of God. Salvation is of God. The whole work of salvation, past, present, and even in the future, because we are told our salvation has a threefold process, all of it is all about God and his work in years of my life. In our day, we live in a pretty late hour, and it's important to understand this truth and take every opportunity we have to present the gospel. Time's short. Trust that when you're, sh when you're sharing that that is an open door, he's already gone before you. He's already present, working in the heart of that individual you're talking to. But once we're saved, the Holy Spirit takes up residence in our hearts. He seals us with the assurance of our soul's eternal state. You'll find that in Ephesians chapter 1. When you come to know Jesus Christ, the Savior, and Lord, and the Holy Spirit comes in your life, one of the things he does, he seals you. And I, I, I know I've de demonstrated this before, but back in the olden days, if Caesar wanted to communicate with Pontius Pilate or Herod or whatever, he would always write the letter, seal, uh, take some wax, use the emperor's signet ring, and put it on there, and it would dry, and it would be given to a courier, and it would be sent to Jerusalem, and on the other end, Pilate or Herod or whoever would know that no one opened that thing because the seal was still there, Un unopened. And that's what Paul is saying about you and I. You was in a, a very common occurrence back then, that you were sealed. You're getting to heaven. I got a lot. You got to love. You just got to love that. But Holy Spirit is our comforter. Jesus says, I will pray to the Father, and he will send you another comforter that you may abide. he may abide with you forever. The New American Standard, that's the New American Standard version. The Amplified version expands on that and says a, a comforter is a counselor, a helper, an intercessor, an advocate, a strengthener, and standby that he might be with you forever. And the comfort, the comfort that Jesus is obviously talking about is the Holy Spirit. How is the Holy Spirit your comforter? Well, we just got some uh, definitions there. He's your counselor. He offers guidance to you whenever you need it. Or you need discernment. He is there. He is drawing people closer to you, uh, to Jesus through you, and he's drawing you closer to Jesus as well. He counsels us through the Word of God, the preaching of the Word of God. When you hear a pastor on the radio or TV, however the Word gets to you, you are getting counsel. He's our helper. He's one who helps, aids, assists. I love this one. He's our intercessor. According to Romans chapter 8, he continuously prays to the Father on your behalf. Because there's a lot of times you and I go, nobody cares. We may be going through those woe is me moments. Nobody cares. Nobody loves me. Nobody understands. What am I doing here? My job stinks. My boss is a jerk. And I have whatever. Church, you know, whatever your head's going through. The reality is, is that there's somebody in the background praying for you to snap out of it. Or if there's something going on in your life, the Holy Spirit knows more than you know. And it says that he groans with deep words. And he who understands the mind of the Spirit, that's the Father, is understanding and hearing the prayer that is being prayed for you. So don't ever think that someone never prays for you because there's someone that's praying for you 24-7. I like that. 
It's an unbelievable gift. That ought to just lift your spirits up to know that. He's our advocate. A person who publicly supports or recommends a particular cause or policy. The devil is your main accuser, the uh, Jesus, excuse me, the Holy Spirit, and he blasts you every day. The Holy Spirit's your advocate. He takes up our case. He's our strengthener. Whenever you need strength, boom, it's there. You constantly see in the book of Acts this constant wording. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. They were filled with the Holy Spirit, they were, and something took place. A miracle take, took place. A healing took place. Philip on the, on the road is speaking to the uh, Ethiopian eunuch, filled with the Holy Spirit. You see that all the time. The Holy Spirit is there to give you power and strength. And it's in the present active tense. Be continually filled with the Holy Spirit. It's not a one-time thing. It's a difference between the Holy Spirit coming in residence in you. There's another difference of strengthening you. And that strength is what you need and you and I need all the time. Every morning, that should be your prayer as you get out of bed. God, I need you for today. I need to be the best employee I can be. I need to be the best retiree I can be, good steward of what I have, or whatever it might be, praying for your wife or your roommate or whatever. It should be the first thing that we do. He's our, uh, that he's our strengthener, you'll find that in Acts chapter 1, verses 6 through 8. When, so when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you're restoring the kingdom to Israel? They thought Jesus was setting up the kingdom. As a matter of fact, when Jesus went into heaven, they had thought he was coming right back. 300 times in the New Testament it's mentioned, Jesus is coming back. And here we are, 2,023 years later, Jesus is coming back. When the last person gets saved, it's going to be a party on the way up to heaven. Uh, Jesus said to them, it's not for you to know the times or epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority. But you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria, even to the ends of the earth. They were thinking, hey, there's the kingdom. King's here. They knew he was the king. Time to set it up. Let's get rid of these Romans and all the hypocrites that were running Jerusalem and the religious authorities. But that's not what Jesus had in mind. Jesus had in mind billions of people that would follow him to heaven. And that's the way it is today. Seven billion people on the planet, I think uh, two, to th two to two and a half are Christians. Eight billion on the planet, 2.5 2 to three are Christians. That's a lot of people in heaven. The Holy Spirit is our guide who reveals to our minds and our hearts truth as it relates to Scripture, worship, doctrine, Christian living. He gives us discernment. He helps us along the way. Here's a picture of an old lady. And hopefully it will come up on the screen. I'm hopefully you can picture. Can you see the old lady in the picture? She's got that big nose, little thing coming up out of her hair. Big chin. Is that what you see? Is that what you see? Do you see an old lady? Can you all see the old lady? Can you see anything else in there? Huh? I can't hear. Somebody said something over here. A pretty woman. Can you see the pretty woman? Her black hair, she's looking the opposite direction. There's her eyelid, you know. You and I need discernment all the time. Things are not always what they appear to be. All the time. Because our head, that we, sometimes we get in our heads and we're just playing out this stuff going on. And, and when you get to work, it's like, everybody's cool. But on the way to work, you're like, oh, the boss is a jerk. The coffee's going to take lousy. They're not going to have any honey or sugar and blah, you know. We just show up, and it's like everything's cool. But life like, is like that at times, where we see it one way, and somebody sees it another way, and guess who sees it the other way? Holy Spirit. And he gives you the discernment to be able to make, to understand what's taking place. Or he provides the word, or brother or sister in Christ, who has the gift of discernment. But it comes your way. 
God is all about helping us out, revealing truth to our minds. The Bible, if this Bible is not making sense to you tonight, the words are not popping out, there's a pretty good chance that you have a problem because it's the Holy Spirit's job to make this real, this real and, to, and to come alive to you. And they're like, oh, I never saw that before. I've read this text a million times. Really? No kidding. I didn't know that was there. That's the revelation of the Holy Spirit for your life. And if he's not there, it may be evident that you don't know him as Savior and Lord. Holy Spirit teaches you and I. John chapter 14, 26. The helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to remembrance all that I said to you. Big phrase there. He will bring back to remembrance all that I said to you. It's the Holy Spirit's job to bring things back into yours and ours' heads. That's why it's important that you're in the Word, that you have a, shall we say, a metaphorical uh, Rolodex of memory verse cards. Because you never know when you're going to need a word from the Lord. You never know when you need an encouraging word. You never know when someone's standing right in front of you and they need a word right then and there. Holy Spirit already knows that. And he will provide that word for you to bring them. But on a greater scale, when he's talking to the disciples, he says, and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. You guys have watched The Chosen? Who's not watched The Chosen? You have not seen The Chosen. Raise your hand. Wow, okay. Go read it. Go watch it. It's very good. I, th I think it's in the third season that just passed, or maybe it's in the second season. But they kind of give personalities to the uh, disciples who would become the apostles. And Matthew is kind of given this weird that he's kind of got a little autism going on, and he's really good with numbers and because uh, he was a tax collector. He better have been good with numbers. But you always see him going around taking notes of what Jesus was saying. As a matter of fact, you see the interaction between him and Jesus where Jesus would go, did you get that? Did you get that, Matthew? Matthew's just busy writing it down. But the disciples weren't following Jesus with, with uh, plates and little instrument to write down all that Jesus was saying. They were taking it all in. They were living in the moment. But the Holy Spirit brought back to their remembrance everything that Jesus had taught them. Hence, you have this today. The Bible. Infallible in its original languages, by the way. And by the way, when I say infallible in the original language, the original language of the New Testament is what? Greek. Mostly Greek. A little bit of Aramaic. A uh, little bit of uh, 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 Hebrew, but mostly Greek. And if you look at textual criticism, <clears throat> back in the early church, there were five Areas that everybody looked up to. Constantinople, Antioch, Rome, Alexandria. And all these places, all these five cities had their own scribes who were writing down the scriptures over and over and over again. And through textual criticism, meaning taking a look at what was written in Alexandria, Egypt, or Constantinople in Turkey, there's a, it's Uniform. There's virtually no errors. It's amazing when you think about it. That's God, the Holy Spirit. And if you look at how the Jews wrote their Bible, I mean the, the, the scribes and Pharisees, when they wrote, let's just take the book of Isaiah, which is a pretty long book, by the way, they had a system down where they could count every vowel and every consonant in, that, in the book of Isaiah. And if it was out, off by one, you know what they did with it? They burned it and started all over again to rewrite Isaiah word for word. And when in this system that they had put together, when it was validated to be identical to the what that was at that time was the original, then they burned the original. And the copy became the original. All the way through down the centuries. Holy Spirit brings things back to remembrance. People are smart. People can figure out how to do things in such a way as to, uh, to give glory and honor to what God deserves. How does he teach you? He teaches you by you getting into the word. Be diligent to present yourself to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, handling accurately the word of truth. 
to know the word and be able to defend its meaning is the calling of every Christian. How are you doing in studying your word? There are, in the internet, there are commentaries galore that you can help get, uh, get and help you as you study. How about memorizing the word? That word I've treasured in my heart that I may not sin against you. What mechanism do you have to memorize God's word? Because as you memorize God's word, you're feeding your mind and you're giving the Holy Spirit tools to use in your life. When was the last time you even memorized a scripture, uh, a, a verse? You should have a system down. I have a stack of memory verse cards, I think, like this. And I go through them. I sit in my office on my desk and I just go through them over and over and over and over and over. That's my system. And it works for me. If you don't have memory verse cards, uh, I don't know if Nav Press is still in existence, but look up online Nav Press memory verse cards. Start someplace. Well, what's your favorite verse? Start there. Write it down, or you uh, they have those index cards by Avery. You know, they look like business cards, write your own business card. The software is free to download. Put the paper in your printer, and you can just take any verse, and you can just copy and paste it into the square, fill up the whole page, print it out, and away you go. But you've got to have something in your life to minister to you and to strengthen you. And it's called memorizing the scripture. And then, obviously, to meditate. My eyes anticipate the night watches, is David. My eyes anticipate the night watches that I may meditate on your word. He couldn't wait for the sun to go down, hang out in his bedroom, and just enjoy reading or hearing the word of God, because obviously, as king, you could have somebody to read you your own personal text. But you're meditating on the word. God has his part to play. You've got your part to play. The Holy Spirit is a gift giver. The Holy Spirit gives the believer, that's you, spiritual gift or gifts to work for the good of the body of Christ. This is explained in First Corinthians. It's already up there. Awesome. Now, there are a variety of gifts. Now, get this. You're going to see the Trinity in here. This is really cool. Now, there are a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit. <gasps> oh, there's one. And there's a variety of ministries, but the same Lord. Oh, there's two. There are a variety of effects, but the same God. Oh, there's three. God the Father, who works all things in all persons. But to each one is given a, the manifestation of the Spirit for what? What's it say? Somebody help me out here. I can't read it up there. It says the common good. Who's the common good? You're the common good. Moving on to the next slide, this is verse 11, dropping down. But one in the same spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually just as you want. Right? No. He wills. When you, say, when you hear somebody go, I asked for the Holy Spirit to give me the gift of healing, and he gave it to me, that is simply not scriptural. It is not biblical. The gifts or gifts of the Spirit come from Him. It doesn't matter what your spiritual gift is or how you think it may be small compared to somebody else. What matters is what are you doing with the spiritual gift? What are you doing with it? Everyone is different. Everyone will be held to account. We're told in the, back, the verse, uh, if you'll be, uh, are you able to slide back to 1 Corinthians 12? The, uh, there are a variety of gifts for the same spirit. There are a variety of ministries for the same Lord. There are a variety of effects. You can have the gift of evangelism. You may be really great one-on-one -on -one as an evangelist, but put you in, a bunch of, in front of a bunch of people, you suck, you know? Same gift. What's the difference? Because it's God the Father who is, excuse me, that is determining the effects. I'm not a great glory. Anybody a great glory in here? Yeah, I don't think so. Standing before 40, 50,000 people giving the gospel as if it was right off the top of his tongue. That's a gift. It's evangelism. It's a different kind of effect, but it's still evangelism. And God will hold him to account, just like he made, let's say you have the gift of evangelism, but... You're on a different scale. So it doesn't matter the scale. What matters is that you're in the ball game. 
Now, what are some spiritual gifts? In this slide here, this next slide coming up, these are 20 spiritual gifts that are listed in the, in the New Testament. I'm going to kind of get out of the way because hopefully you can see that. If you can, great. I'll go through them one by one. It's now 8.33 and we'll be done in about an hour and a half. Just kidding. Okay, first one is encouragement. You ever run into a Debbie Downer? Oh my gosh, I'm out of here, man. But an encouraging Eddie? You can't wait to get right next to him. What do you got new for the day? Man, encouraging word. There are some people that have the gift of encouragement, and man, they're amazing to be around. They just know how to encourage people. They just have this sense about seeing what's going on and what kind of a word you may need, and boom, there it is. And man, you're lifted up. Because remember, the gifts are to be employed in the body of Christ for the common good. Remember that. Giving. Did you know that giving is a spiritual gift? Wait a second. I think the Bible of Bobby says that we're all supposed to tithe. Doesn't it say that? Yes, it does. Everybody is supposed to tithe of their income to support the body of Christ. But there are some people who have the gift of giving. They just make money hand over fist without even getting out of bed. You know? It's like, how do they do that? God, why can't I have that gift? Come on. You know, cut me some slack here. You know? You know, this individual who's a multi-gazillionaire shared this with a team earlier. Walks into a casino and hits 50,000 bucks right off the bat. Hey, they don't need no 50,000 bucks. Give me a break. But some people just, God just blesses. And I happen to know this person blesses the church. There are some people that have the gift of giving. They know they have the gift of giving, and they give above and beyond. Because not everybody has that gift. You may have that gift and you don't even know it. But it is a gift. The gift of giving is a gift, although all are called to give, to tithe. Leadership. Leadership is a, is a gift. There are some people that just, man, there's something that needs to be done. Boom, somebody's out in front taking charge. It's a gift of leadership. And they know how to corral people. They know how to bring people together. They know how to delegate, you know. But there's one person who runs a show. Everybody kind of falls in line. Okay, that guy knows what he's talking about. Or that girl knows what you, we're there. You know, leadership. How about mercy? Do you have the gift of mercy? Pastor Mark, who's uh, uh, one of our pastors here, he's got the gift of mercy. A mercy giver's basic motivational drive is to sense and respond to the emotional and spiritual needs of others. He's on it. Those with mercy, motivational gift, have divine ability to sense hurt and respond to it with love and understanding. The mature mercy giver is kind and gentle. Mercy givers are attracted to people in distress. They love to help people out. Whereas most people may run away from somebody, the person with mercy just runs right to it. Mercy, the gift of mercy is love that loves the unlovable the handicapped, the elderly, the seriously ill, the wounded in spirit. They're drawn to people who are outcasts, out of fellowship, or rebellious. Mercy givers run to those kind of people, reflecting the very heart of God as a merciful God. Some people have the gift of mercy, or variations thereof. Prophecy is the next one. Now, that's not... Thus says the Lord, he's coming back in 2025. Write it down. August 25th, 7 a.m. No, p.m. Which one is it, Holy Spirit? 7 a.m. or 7 p.m.? No, that's not the gift of prophecy. The gift of prophecy is being able to take what you know and foretell it in such a way that people have an understanding of what it is that God is doing. The gift of prophecy. The gift of service. Did you know that was a gift? Everybody's called to serve, but there are some people that are really good at it. They're just, they just, they know when to turn it on, man. They're, they're just there. Teaching is a spiritual gift. Second Timothy 2, uh, 2 says, the thing, Paul says to Timothy, the things that you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, these entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. There are people that are really good teachers have a good grasp of biblical concepts and are able to 
bring it down to a way in which we can all respond. Administration. Administration, what? Yeah, administration. Most senior pastors of large churches have the gift of administration. They're able to take the big thing and they're able to break it down and bring people in and delegate. Administration is bringing people together and delegating to the right people for the common good. Administrators thrive on organizing people to get things done. They love working with people. There are two types of uh, uh, administrators. One is the extrovert. The extrovert loves working with people. So bringing them all in. Hey, you belong there, you belong here, you belong there. Let's make it happen. Then there's the introvert who kind of is in the background, running the program, don't really see him too much, but things get done. Discernment is a gift. Everybody should have a, a, a degree of discernment in their lives, but there are some people that are just really are able to take a look at a situation and go, boom, that's what's going on. They're good at it. Now, these are sign gifts, the gift of healing. Interpretation of languages and languages. And I'll be honest with you, since I know everything there is to know about the Bible, just kidding, I'm not sure about this one here. There are some people that say these sign gifts are no longer exist in the church today. There are other people that say, yeah, they do. Healing would be able to go and talk to and, and, and pray over somebody and they're healed. Whatever it may be. Sickness, an infirmity, cancer. What I have gone to the hospital to pray over people. Next day they're out of the hospital. I'm like, how did that happen? I don't have the gift of healing. No, I have the gift of prayer, and God answers prayer, but there are some people that just can boom, pray and things happen. Different kind of languages in the, new, in the Bible. One of them is a language. So, if I get up here and all of a sudden, anybody speak Russian? Where's Natalia? She's not here tonight. Okay, good. So I can use Russian. I may come in here and start talking in Russian. And everybody's going, is this guy drunk or something? It's 7.30. We've already started tipping the bottle. And then there's a the guy way in the corner, stands up and he starts interpreting what I just said. That is the biblical languages, interpretation of languages. There's a heavenly language. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a literal language. Does that happen today? I, I don't see why not. There's over 6,000 people, groups all over the world, they haven't even heard the gospel yet. Somebody has to teach them in their language. Why wouldn't that uh, continue to exist? I would say healing gifts and interpretation of lines and languages and languages still exist. Wisdom. There are people that are really good at how to take biblical principles and apply them in situations. That's biblical wisdom. It's simply taking biblical truth and applying it in such a way that it, you're honoring God and you're blessing people. Now, I know this gift does not exist anymore. anymore. The gift of being an apostle. One of the criteria of being an apostle is that you had to have seen the Lord Jesus Christ personally. And you and I were blessed with 12 apostles. Now, apostle means sent one. So in a general sense, we're all apostles. We all, we're all sent ones to go and represent the king. But as to the gift of being an apostle, I think that one ended when the apostle John was the last to live and die. Then there's faith. People just have faith. And man, you get around them and they just believe God for everything and things happen. Some people just have that. The next one is helps. That would be pretty obvious. There are some people that just love to help. They see a need, boom, they're there. And they excel at it. And if somebody needs assistance, Somebody needs money. Somebody needs gas. Somebody needs food. They're just there. That's the gift of helps. The gift of knowledge. The gift of miracles is number 18. As I understand the gift of miracles, if there's someone who needs a miracle in their life, and I needed a miracle in my life, and no one came to me and prayed over me, well, that's not true. People did pray over me, and I don't know if because of that God did what he did. But a miracle would be that, or like the Apostle Paul, 
For man, power was radiating from him by just what? It's a garment. It's a rag. Would touch the apostle Paul, they'd bring it over to this person over here and go, here, boom, you know, healed. A miracle took place. Does that exist today? I don't know. The gift of pastorship obviously exists, and finally, evangelism obviously exists today. But I got to ask you this question, all of humility. We kind of went through 20 of them real fast. Let's keep that slide up there, uh, Mark, if you would, please. Do you know what your spiritual gift is? If you don't, and you're a Christian, you got to find out what it is. You've been given at least one, maybe more. I think I have four or five spiritual gifts, personally. I've gone through a spiritual gift test, and I score really high in some areas. The other ones, not so much. Are you using your spiritual gift if you know that you have or what it is? And if your answer to my question just now is no, may I lovingly submit to you, you're in a risky place. God is not going to let you and I slide on this. It is a gift given by him for you to employ to build up the body of Christ. Now, it is said that 90% of the people don't do jack in the church. They may do Jill, but they don't do jack. Okay? Okay. They don't give, they just sit there, take it all in, don't do anything. If that applies, that statistic applies to spiritual gifts and the employment, man, we're like the Jenga game. You know what the Jenga game is? You know the little blocks? Stand about yay high and everybody's pulling out a little block of wood and pretty soon the thing falls over. But if 90% of the wood's gone, how does the church prosper? How does the church minister to itself? It can't. And God's not going to say, ah, oh, it's okay, you're in heaven now, you know, bygones are bygones, no worries, all good, come on in. Nah, nah, sorry, we ain't getting off that easily. He's going to hold us to account. And at the same time, in not using our spiritual gifting, there is a loss of spiritual power, there's a loss of spiritual prowess, effectiveness, spiritual victory in your life, in our life. All because, really, of disobedience. Now, I say disobedience because that's kind of a harsh term, but it's really true. If we've all been given a spiritual gift, and some are employing it and most are not, that's disobedience. How do you figure out what your spiritual gift is? If you don't know what it is, how do you figure it out? It's really simple. Start anywhere. Just start anywhere. Here at Orange County Singles for Christ, we need greeters. We need guys to help out with the cameras. If you look back at the cameras right now, there's nobody manning the cameras. They're on auto. Now, why would that be? Because both guys that we have are sick tonight. We need more people on the, the camera team. One time, one time a month, run the camera. It is so easy. You could do it in your sleep. Uh, our cafe team, I'm told, needs a few people. You have the spiritual gift of tithing. We certainly can use more tithers here, that's for sure. Maybe you're one of those types that just makes money by just getting out of bed and watching TV. <laughs> that's true. There's a reason for that. Because God has gifted you to do that to assist the church. Hey, support this church. We could use your help. But you've got to get involved. And you'll find out soon enough where you fit in. You start serving and greeting, and you're up there greeting people, and you're kind of like, yeah, you know, it is, it, yeah, you know, there's this fun. I like meeting people, but it's it's not for me. Oh, great, move to something else. You will eventually find out what your spiritual gift is, and the qualifier in the end is people are going to go, man, you're really good at that. You play the piano. You're really, man, you're awesome. There's a girl in here, Audrey. I don't know, Audrey's around here someplace. She's really good at playing the piano. Gifted, you know. Is that her natural gift or spiritual gift? I don't know. But if it's her spiritual gift, it's kind of obvious because people will testify and go, you know what, you're really good at what you do. God is so sovereign when it comes to your participation in the body of Christ, and I'm going to end with this, that he knows exactly where to place you to get maximum effectualness in your life and through your life. Do you know that? He's so sovereign, he's even over that process. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 18. 
says this, but God, but now God has placed the members, each one of them, in the body just as you desired. Right? No. He desired. God's so sovereign over everything that's taking place here. He knows exactly where to place you. He places you where he wants you to be. It's kind of funny, this thing about salvation, past, present, future, about God. Spiritual gifting. It's all about God. He gives you the gift, and he places you where you need to be to in order to serve with a, with a cheerful heart. It's amazing. And the gifts that you have, there are a variety of effects, but there are many evangelists in here, or many administrators in here, or teachers in here, and each person is simply different as the measure of grace that was given to you and I. To the extent that people are involved in a church determines the health and vitality of any given church. And like I said before, 90% of the people in any given church do nothing. Those are terrible statistics. As any pastor or myself will tell you, there's so much more that we could be doing. I mean, advertising, we are in single heaven right now. Singles all over this church. Down the, down the street, uh, blah, 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 Irvine Center Drive, you, you'll eventually hit the uh, spectrum. There's thousands of apartments full of single adults. Other side of the four or five freeway is Los Olivos. Thousands of condominiums. But you know what? It takes money to reach those folks in advertising. So, with that said, we're going to end the evening. We'll look at the fruit of the Spirit next week. And guess what? <laughs> it's all about Him. And the fruit that you bear is all about Him. Not for you. We'll see that next week. But the Holy Spirit is our teacher. He reveals truth to us. He was already working in our lives before we even became a Christian. He was there. I, I can point back and I can look at my pre-salvation experience and I can go, man, I had no idea what I was doing at that point in time in my life, but I, I, looking back, God sure did. Being a part of Bible studies, I had no idea what these guys were talking about. But I knew what they were talking about was right. I just had this sense, these guys know what they're talking about. I didn't have a clue what they're talking about, but I knew that they knew what they were talking about. That was the Holy Spirit. That was the Holy Spirit. And he's also your gift giver or gifts giver. Many people have more than one to be employed in the body of Christ. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen, our study for tonight. The ministry of the Holy Spirit, yours in my life, and we'll continue that next week. Father in heaven, as the band comes up, wherever the band is, I think the band is behind that door over there. I was right. Bada bing, bada boom. Actually, I planned it that way because there's a doorway. You can just stand right there, and, you'll, and you all you have to do is walk right out. Holy Spirit, thank you so much for your presence in our life. Thank you for your moving in our midst, as only you can do. Thank you for your gifts and your calling in our lives. Help us to be people of the word. Help us to be people who memorize the word. Help us to be people who just read it, to meditate it. Because in doing so, we're just chalking up all sorts of ammo to encourage us by, to witness to others by. Truth is truth. And man, when we share, those are like well-driven nails. The Holy Spirit speaks to us and what seems like just a phrase to somebody else is hitting them like a ton of bricks. We don't know what you're doing in that, meeting, in that moment, but we know you're working because your word says so. And so, Holy Spirit, we just open up our hearts to you, asking and praying that you would move in our, in our hearts, help us in this journey in life, help us to be the people that you want us to be. Help us to be spirit-filled Christians. Help us to be people who are about building each other up in the exercise of our spiritual gifts. In Jesus' name, amen.
Come thou found of every blessing to my heart to sing thy grace streams of mercy never ceasing call for songs of loudest praise teach me some melodious song it sung by flaming tongues above praise the mountain fix the bottom mount of thy be I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. Jesus swore me when a stranger wandering from the fold of God to rescue me from danger interposes precious blood. Jesus paid it all, and all to Him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, He washed it white as snow. Oh, Jesus paid it all, all to Him I owe. And sin. together. Lord, you have saved us. You have brought us out of darkness into light. You have brought us from death to life, so we praise your name.
Thank you, guys. Amen. As we continue in worship, we come to the time of the evening offering. Every church takes an offering to keep the lights on, and we're no different. Uh, so this evening, just uh, thank you so much for your partnership in keeping this church moving forward. Uh, there are various ways to give. As you know, I'm just going to go very, very quickly. You can go online to our website, and you can give online at the Give Me button or Zelle. Uh, which should be in your uh, cell phone smart app. You can just uh, go to your financial institution and use Zelle. All you need to know is the email address there, trose at ocsfc1.org, and that goes immediately to our savings account. Or you can take an envelope home, pray about it, see how God would want to uh, speak to you and through you. And uh, you can also drop your uh, offering in the basket back uh, box back there, or the gentleman will be coming by uh, in just a second to receive the evening offering for those of you who are ready. Thank you so much for partnering with us. So glad that you are. And uh, let's pray, and uh, the band will close us out. Father in heaven, thank you for these moments to, to be together to worship, fellowship, time in your word. Now we continue in a time of worship through our giving of our tithes and offerings. Lord, bless the gift as well as the giver. Help us to pay our bills. Help us to keep us moving down the track as we continue to want and desire to minister to single adults in public. Thank you for these moments of giving. In Jesus' name, amen. Kevin on the Cajun and Miss Riche on the background vocals. Thank you so much for being here tonight and uh, really appreciate it. Awesome worship. As we uh, head to closing the service here in just a moment, uh, our esteemed uh, 
MC will be up to let you know what's going on. Uh, just a couple things before we close it out, uh, at least on my end. For those of you online, thanks for joining us. I appreciate your uh, time and uh, watching on the Internet. Hopefully you're blessed. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you next week, 7.30, same time, same station. God bless you. Have a great weekend. For those of you who are, are still here, obviously, you're still here. Uh, and that's rapture took place and some of us disappeared. Uh, nah, that was the joke. Uh, we'll all disappear of the rapture. Uh, if you'd like to uh, have people pray through you throughout the week, there is a prayer line or uh, email address. Love to hear from you. And that's called, it's info at ocsfc1.org. And many of you, uh, I think our prayer list is, I don't know, 20 long. Uh, but uh, there are people, uh, something may come up during the week and you're going, man, I need some prayer. Please uh, email me. It'll go through me, pray for you, and then it's sent off to our, uh, our prayer ministry to pray for you as well. And there's that slide right there, prayer at ocsfc1.org. Finally, uh, if you were blessed by this evening's worship and message, for those of you you're welcome to go on our, our, our page on Facebook. We have four different sites on Facebook. Uh, one of them is, called, is our page site. It's facebook.com. It's in the middle one there, forward slash OC Singles for Christ. You'll find today, tonight's message already archived. Little share button in the bottom right-hand screen. Share it with anybody you want. The more, the merrier. And uh, so you just never know how God will take a message and encourage somebody by it. I think that's it for me. Have a good night, you guys. We're going to have a, our MC is going to tell you what's going on. We've got desserts and all that kind of stuff. Uh, we have some events that are coming up that are not on the, uh, are on the docket tonight, but are going well on the line. You'll read all about them. Spoiler alert, movie night, dinner movie, July 15th, action movie, Mission Impossible. Go online and read all about it. All right, this guy right here, the handsome Yamo. Give it up for Yamo. All right, keep it going for Thomas Rose, preaching the word. Give it up for the band, show them that the Jesus is in them. There you go. And uh, Joel comes all the way from Santa Barbara. I up. And, uh, but now see, Montecito, Montecito is right next to, yeah, which is like ultra, ultra millionaire things, right? So just so you know, Joel's, um, he's a single guy, and um, he, he has this, he has this, and he's very humble, and he has this small puppy, and